And so this morning, the message is entitled, The Eternal Life Issue. Now there's a lot of people today that are spending a lot of time, they're spending a lot of money going to doctors and doing everything they can think of so they don't have to die. In John chapter 10, act like you're going to live forever. They live like they're going to live forever. They're doing what they want to do, verse 28. But the Bible says, I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now when do we get this eternal life? Do we have to wait until we die? No. We're going to find out that this message is going to require a lot of foresight. And it's going to require you to have a fairly open mind. Most people refer to eternal life as a continued life after death, as outlined in the Bible. First John chapter 2, verse 25. And this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. In the Apostles' Creed, it testifies, I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. That's in our... Our church creed, what we believe in. Now some people today, they view eternal life commencing at the second coming of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of the dead. But if we look through the Bible, is that what the Bible has to say? There are many references in the Bible about eternal life. And this eternal life starts while we're here, right now. We have it right now, this morning. And no man can pluck us out of the Father's hand. And this is why I said what I said this morning. There are people that go to church. And I call them churchgoers. They do not have eternal life. They are still hell bound. Because they're still doing it their way. And they're not doing it God's way. And there is no other way to go but God's way. In a couple of million years, what are you going to be thinking about? Are you going to be a distant memory? Well, we can't even bring up stuff that happened 2,000 years ago, and they think they're so smart. Oh, well, we don't know. We got these scrolls of 5,000 years ago. Uh, we got this, and oh, we got 10,000 years. We dug up something, but we don't know what it is. We're scientists. Our scientists are still working on it. In Psalms 39 and verse 1, the Bible says, I said, I will take to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb in silence. I held my peace even from good. And my sorrow was stirred. Verse 3 says, My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then spoke I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail that I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a handbreadth, and my age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. Surely every man walketh in vain. Show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in thee. And so maybe we think the children who would be saved from extinction won't have that much in common with us. And what I'm talking about, this climate change that's going on right now, there are some people saying we're going to have a mass extinction here before the next hundred years happens because we're all going to be choked to death by these noxious fumes that people are breathing. They're not going to last. We got uh, our cities along the coastline are going to be gone because they're going to be covered over in water. The air is not going to be fit to breathe. Because we have people in our legislation right now who care less, and they are denying what's going to happen in the future, 
and they got this little young girl, Greta, that's running around the country, and Trump has the audacity to attack this girl and talk to her like she ain't got a bit of sense. Yeah. And we got Jane Fonda that goes and stands in front of the uh, White House all the time protesting that. And then Sally Field went the other day and she got arrested too. <laughs> in a thousand years, the political map will have changed. Trump will have been nothing but something that was passed that people won't even, probably won't even remember him or his name or anything about him. But that one thing certain, those who are saved. In John chapter 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is what it being eternal life is all about. We come to church for what reason? Hmm? We come to church because we're Christians. We don't have to come to church because we want to be a Christian. We come here because we are Christians. People that don't want to come to church and have other things to do on Sunday morning, well, are they Christians? Do they really think they're going to get into God's heaven? If they don't have eternal life, how are they going to get into God's heaven? Eternal life starts now. Eternal life is happening right now in your presence. I said before and many times before now, that I'm 75 years old, my wife is 74, and we don't have much time left in front of us if you look at it in the flesh. But we've got eternity sitting right there in front of us. We're all, we are now living in eternity, right now. We don't have to wait until we die. We're living there right now. If we're not going to do what God says to do now, how will we do it after we have passed? We won't, will we? We need to get that through our head. If we're not going to do it God's way now, we're never going to do it God's way. And so why would God want us into his heaven? A rebellious people that could care less and tremble all over his word? Come on now. Maybe languages in the future is going to be different. Technology will be so advanced, we may think it's even like magic. But eternal life, we're still going to be living. And what's going to happen when they get all the newest of the new that they can get? What are they going to look for then? According to the mainstream theology, after death, but before the second coming, the saved live with God in an immediate state. That means Charlie's with God right now. That's what that means. That's what we believe. He is with God right now. Or Larry's with God. And Kay. And, uh, and Lord knows all, all the other ones that have been that have lived here and acquired eternal life while they were here in this church. They are now with God. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. They are now with God, and they're living eternal life right now. Their, their life started while they was here, and now all it is doing is continuing. Yes, they shed their mortal bodies just like we're going to. And then one day, the Lord's going to come back, and He's going to change these bodies and give them immortality. And that way we'll be able to live here on earth as well as in heaven because we will have immortal bodies. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so after the second coming experience, the physical resurrection of the dead and the physical recreation of a new earth, John says in the book of Revelation, I saw a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven was gone and the first earth was dissolved and there was no more sea. And so if people were planning on living here, no one going to dig in the ground and have me a bomb shelter under the ground. They better take a look at that movie 2012 and look how that all, <laughs> all them continents rose up and fell and moved and went under the ocean. And what are they going to do in their bomb shelter under the ocean? When, when are they going to come out of their bomb shelter under the ocean? When are they going to be able to breathe air again? Are they, are, are they going to be real? No, they're going to be dead. They're just going to be dead and under the ground and completely away from us. The Catholic Church believes by death the soul is separated from the body. But in the resurrection of God will give incorruptible life to our body, transformed by the reunion of our soul. Well, just as Christ is a man and he is risen and he lives forever, all of us will rise at the last day. Yes, we're going to rise at the last day in our new bodies. But we're going to have eternal life beginning from the moment 
that we're living here for Christ today. We're going to be living forever right now. And this is the promise. In Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30, the Bible says, The fruit of righteousness is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. Behold, the righteous, verse 31, shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So if God is going to do us a great thing, he's going to do everybody a great thing. But some people are not going to like the great thing that God's going to do for them. Because we all are going to live forever. That is what we need to understand. Everybody, nobody's going to, nobody's going to perish. We're all going to live forever. You have to make the decision where you want to live forever at, in heaven or hell. Because you are going to live forever in one of the two places. And the only way you're going to live forever in God's heaven is by doing what God says to do. John's Gospel, as we go to John chapter 5, presents the possibility of eternal life as being right now, as I've just been saying. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that hath sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. We are going to live forever, but those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't say the ones that said, Jesus, come into my heart. That's not going to get you to live forever. It's the ones that believe. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 said, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth and shalt believe in thine heart, then thou shalt be saved. Now, the confession with the mouth is what you believe in your heart. It doesn't say a thing about asking Jesus into your heart. And John those who accept Christ can possess life, eternal life, right here and right now, as well as in eternity. For they have passed from death to life. He who hears my word and believes him that sent me has eternal life, and does not come into judgment, but has passed from death unto life. At the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter uh, 20, Around about verse 10, we see a great white throne. If you appear at that great white throne it's for judgment, it's only to tell you what your eternal destiny is. And then John said he seen people standing there, but there was no heaven and there was no earth. There was nothing, but yet they were standing before God. And their punishment was being handed out to them. They were being told that that judgment there, they were going to be cast in to the lake of fire. Whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. The last verse of John chapter 20. And John, the purpose of the incarnation, death, the resurrection, and glorification of the word was to provide eternal life for all humanity that wanted to live with God. Eternal life. Because what they talk about someone that's going to the lake of fire as eternal death or eternal punishment, the second death. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. We have to understand, not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is getting into heaven. Not everyone that comes and sits in the church house is going to heaven. And they might not believe in hell right now. But I want to tell you something this morning, church. It doesn't matter if you believe in hell right now. It doesn't matter if you believe in God right now. But what does matter, when you do get into hell, it won't take you but a half a second before you believe in God then. Because you'll know that God sent you there. Or let you go there because you rejected Him. Now you can... You can go to hell if that's what you want, but God doesn't want you to. He's provided a way for you to escape going to hell. But if you don't take the way that God has, well, then you have no other alternative. Keep in mind that the only ones living will be those who have put their trust in Christ. <coughs> that means after the people are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, the only ones living will be those who are real with God today and will be with God in eternity. <coughs> now, 
I say this this morning because this is going on YouTube as well. People out there who get a chance to watch this video, I want you to know that you need to be thinking about your own destiny. Will you be in heaven or will you be someplace else? Now, it's entirely up to you the decision you make. I may be dead and in the grave for hundreds of years before you see this message. But if you happen to see it, you need to decide this very day. Because I will, I've already been living in eternity. Though this body may have perished and the Lord will have come back yet, I will still be living in eternity with all of my loved ones in heaven. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. <coughs> Excuse me. And this life is in His Son. Get me a cough drop here. I got a tickle in my throat for some reason. <coughs> and verse 12, Marie. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So if you have Jesus this morning, you already have eternal life. You're already on your way to heaven. And so when they have a funeral for you, if they get to have one, you know what? You already be in heaven. Matter of fact, by the time that doctor gets there to pronounce you dead, you will already have been in heaven. You already be living with the Lord. So it makes everything work toward every effort that a person must do. If you don't have a purpose this morning, suddenly your purpose needs to be going to heaven and not to hell. In the Pauline Apostles, the letters of Paul, in the New Testament, he writes that eternal life becomes possible in the person of Jesus Christ. Whereby the grace of God, through faith in Christ, humans can receive the gift of eternal life. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 8, For he that sowed to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sowed to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. For Paul and in the future eternal life, it arrives as a result of the indwelling Holy Spirit during this present life. It's like, <clears throat> I preached some messages a few years back, and I talked about a parachute. Because I used to be a paratrooper. I was in the 82nd Airborne Division. I made several jumps about 45 of them. And when I come out of an airplane, if I didn't have a parachute on, I'd been in bad shape. Because that ground would be coming up. It wouldn't be the jump that would kill you. It'd be that sudden stop at the bottom. That's what would kill you. I mean, you could laugh and drink and have a good time all the way down. But when you hit the ground, you're gone. If you don't have a parachute. And that parachute is going to keep you from hitting the ground so hard. If you die without Jesus Christ, it's going to be like dying but jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. Because there's going to be nothing there to catch you. You're going to be falling into a dreadful place. Paul views sin as an obstacle up to attaining eternal life. He says in Romans chapter 6, for the wages of sin is death, verse 23. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Paul, eternal life is a future possession. And it's a goal towards which he believes and he strives to get to. Paul emphasizes that eternal life is not merely something to be earned, but it is a gift from God. And God gives gifts to those who love Him. How many people do you buy Christmas gifts for if you uh, do this Christmas thing that you don't know? Think about that. How many people do you send gifts to that well, you don't even know who they are? 
or what they're doing or anything else about them. Would not God be similar? Why would he give the gift of eternal life to someone that he doesn't even know? Or they don't know him. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6, 23. The wages of sin is death. And if we don't get ourselves right and have something, not something, but somebody who will pay the price for our sinfulness, and we won't be in heaven. We'll be with the devil. The wages of sin is death. The free gift of God is through Jesus Christ. He who sows to the Spirit shall reap of the Spirit eternal life. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 16, he says, How be it, for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all those suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him life everlasting. Not everybody agrees on everything, but we all have to agree about what the Word of God has to say. And the Word of God is pretty concise. Whether you want to believe you don't inherit your eternal life until you die, if you don't want to believe you inherit it right now, I don't have a problem with it. But stop to think a minute. What can you do to get eternal life after you die? You know, if you cut a tree down, how much more is it going to grow after it hits the ground? Break off a flower. How much more is that flower going to grow once it's broke off? How can you do anything after you have died? It is appointed once to die and then the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. That means after you're dead, immediately, within a split second, you're going to be standing in the presence of an almighty God. And if you don't know him, he's going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, iniquity where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But if he knows you, how else, how else will he know you? By that Holy Spirit living within you? By the eternal life that you already have. When you stand in front of him, he will know that you already have eternal life. That's how he's going to know you. And that's how I can say I know that Charlie's with the Lord now. Because he had eternal life before he left here. Now the body, oh well, the body is like a sail on a ship. It's been out there on the ocean for a long time. Then a lot of hurricanes come by and a lot of strong winds and a lot of beating on the sails. You ever seen a, one of these ocean ships, that, old wooden ships, how, how beat up they look when they roll into port? They got to get out there and they got to paint them and they got to put stuff in between the planks and all that to keep them from leaking. And they got to fix the sails and all that kind of stuff. That's what our body's like. Like a ship sailing on the sea. And it's been beaten and bruised and banged around. And very few of us lead this life in excellent condition. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. He advises us to fight a good fight of faith, to hold on to eternal life. How could you, if he would stop to think of some of the things he was saying, how could you do this if you didn't already have it? He already had it. But he was having trouble convincing the people at the time that they already had it. Because some of them was being fed to the lions. They took some of the Christians at the time and they wrapped oily rags around them. And they wrapped them around the post. And the Emperor Nero lit them afire so they could light up the games that they were having. Where the Christians fought the lions at night. And they would be the lights for the game. The burning Christians. They was, he was having a hard try at the time. 
telling them people, you already have eternal life with it. They were maybe having difficulty understanding it. What about you today? What would happen today if somebody said you couldn't come to church? Would you still come? If they told you, if I see you at that church again, I'm going to shoot you. Would you come? Well, that's exactly what they told them. They're going to die unless they renounce Jesus Christ. They confessed him as their Savior openly. They believed on him in their heart. But if they renounced him, they would be set free. They said, no, I don't believe on Jesus no more. Matter of fact, I never did. I just did it because my mama wanted me to, or my daddy, or whoever. And if they did that, then they lost their eternal life, didn't they? Or maybe they never had it to begin with, huh? Because how can you have tasted the good gift and know the things that are to come? Go back. How can you go back? It's like me. I drive an electric car. And I've had an electric car for five or six years. I could never go back to a gasoline automobile. That would be the worst thing in the world I could do, I think. Yeah, I got a van that uses gas. As soon as I can get to a point that I can buy an electric pickup truck, I'm going to. Because you can't beat it. I don't have to go to gas stations. I don't have to pay these outrageous prices when they do go up, which they're going to here in the near future. They're going to go up and up and up and up, and I'm still going to be plugging in. And not only that, I can close up my garage and turn the heater on in my car, and I can stay in it for hours on end if I want to. You try that in your car. If it's a gasoline car, you'll be dead in two hours. Yeah. So what do you think you're releasing into the air? All that pollution you're putting into the air. And take that times something like nine billion people in across the world today. Six billion automobiles in, or maybe ten billion, who knows? There's a bunch of vehicles out there and they're all spewing out fumes. It's like eternal life is like I'm looking at an electric car versus a nice car internal combustion engine car and looking at my Christian life and comparing it that's a comparison I see I would never go back to driving a nice car and neither would I ever go back to not being a Christian if my lot is to be here in Pine Grove, West Virginia until I die then that's my lot if it's not wherever God wants me to be that's where I want to be because wherever the Lord is that's where his saints are going to be. In the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the Good Samaritan, it begins with a question about eternal life. In Luke 10, 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, how do you inherit eternal life? If you inherit something, think about it. All it has to do for you to receive your inheritance is you to be the person you're supposed to be. St. Charlie left all, all of his money to his wife and all of his tools and everything he had. How, how does Loretta get all that stuff? Just by being Loretta, right? What does she have to do to inherit it? It's already been done. And the same thing has been done for us through Jesus Christ. All we have to do is be who we're supposed to be. And we have eternal life. Just that simple. Be a Christian. And you're on your way to heaven right now today. The Gospel of Matthew gives us some references to eternal life. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. Behold, one came and said unto him, Good Master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So you think about that. Everybody's thinking about, oh, i got to do all these good things before I can inherit eternal life. But you know, not, heaven's not just for good people. Good, there's going to be a lot of good people that go to hell. Yeah, being good doesn't get you saved. Being saved gets you to heaven. Being good doesn't, all that does is keep you out of jail. You've got to be good and saved. 
That's what you have to be good and safe. In verse 29, everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or land, for my name's sake, shall receive an hundredfold, and shall hear, inherit eternal life. Now Matthew 25, 46. I want you to read that, Marie. And they shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. What verse uh, um, 40, uh, 45 say? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you did, did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. God wants us to be real. He don't want us to be phonies. He wants us to be real. And that means if you come to church and you claim to be a Christian in church, you ought to be just the same amount of Christian outside of church as you are here. Now we've had a lot of people come. Matter of fact, like I said one time, we had I stand at this altar and I walk down to pray for someone. And there was a couple sitting over here, and they wanted to get married. Well, they got the fist fight just about right in front of the altar here. Cussing and hollering, and I had to step between them to keep them from punching each other. Yeah. Was they really Christians? Was they really living for God? Think about that. You're going to come to church and you're going to fight. What are you going to do in God's heaven? If you're not willing to accept what God has today, how can you accept what God's going to have for you in the future? Well, maybe it don't mean much to you today about going to heaven. But there's going to come a time it does. Jesus advises these people to keep the commandments. And then he refers to entry into the kingdom of God. I'm going to tell you about this doctor I read about on the internet. His name was Ignaz S-E-M-M-E-L-W-E-I-S Semmelweis. Now this is a true story and it's a tragic one but anyway he was an obstetrician. He delivered helped women have their babies. He specialized in childbirth which was one of the main causes back in that century, 19th century, among women until the modern medicine was introduced. He discovered the P-U-E-R, P-E-R-A-L, Propelia, I guess, fever. And it's a fever that would infect women who had given birth. And it was as common as AIDS is in our day. But they could drastically reduce it by the doctors just simply washing their hands before they went in to have, for the woman to have a, her baby. Well, in the hospital where he worked, a lot of the doctors ex examined dead corpses in the morgue. And, they, and then they would leave right out of the morgue and go to help a woman who was having a baby. And they didn't wash their hands. Well, this doctor told them you know, you know, I found out if I wash my hands in the mortality rate of the women and their children, they live longer. He says, I don't understand how it works because back then they didn't have a working knowledge of about germs and stuff like we have today. All he knew was he noticed his patients no longer got some of the disease and ran these fevers and died. Now, what do you think the people did about it? Did they believe him? As a matter of fact, they didn't. Matter of fact, the, the doctors and everyone ridiculed him because he washed his hands. After he had just examined a dead person, he washed his hands before he would go in and help a woman have her baby. And at one point in time, they institutionalized him in the insane asylum. 
in Vienna. He was beaten by the guards and ridiculed. Two weeks after he was institutionalized for simply washing his hands, he died. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we, we got people that come to church today, and there's folks out there that ridicule us about coming to church. What's going to happen when they have to meet the Lord one day? When he died, the hospital worked and began to run properly again. They dismissed the idea of washing their hands before treating patients. The mortality rate again increased, but business went on as usual. It's the same way we're going to heaven. We have to choose to do the right thing. We have to make a choice. Am I going to do it the right way? Am I going to do it God's way? Or am I going to continue on living my life the way I've been living? And God or nobody else is going to tell me how to live my life. You have to make that choice. Now John's gospel differs somewhat from the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. His writings present us with eternal life and not just simply in the future, but also pertaining to the present. And the Bible says this is the disciple whom Jesus loved. But anyway, those who hear the words of Jesus and trust Jesus can possess this life here and now. Oh, you're going to have it in eternity because you're still going to be living no matter what happens to your body, but you're going to still have it. But you are passed from death unto life. John 5, 24. Marie, please. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. So overall we see the balances. He presents us with the future of eternal life, but he also presents us with right now, the present. We have it right now by simply believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 5 says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess him his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 6, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To the angel of the church of Philadelphia, write these things, saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. Verse 8, I know thy works, behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. There are over 37 verses in the Gospel of John, of which about half of them that refer to eternal life. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I'm not just saying asking Jesus to come into your heart, but you believe. You have to believe that He is who He says He is, or you're calling God a liar. Because the testimony is that God sent His Son to die on the cross so He could pay for your sin. If you don't believe Him, there is no way that you can have eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. It's not a future gift belonging to the age to come, but it's a gift that we can receive right now. And if we look in this context, the gift of eternal life, in which sin and death are still present. These sin and death are still present in this condition. But they are contrasted with eternal life and living a righteous life here now, the world to come is what the faithful is going to be living in. 
the world to come. If you are faithful to God, then you will be living in the world to come. In John chapter 3, verse 16, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. God provided the gift of eternal life to believers. The possibility of perishing only remains if you're not a Christian. Only remains that you will not get to heaven if you're not a Christian. If you have a loved one in heaven, you can be assured right now, if you are a Christian, one day you will be reunited with that loved one. Now, why we have so many of these people that were in the churches, like a, say, for instance, <laughs> a woman's husband passed away, and then she goes out and does whatever. She doesn't really believe in eternal life because her husband is going to be in heaven. Now, if they may not be married in heaven, I don't know what they're going to be when we get to heaven because it's going to be a different situation. They may not be married there, but is she going to want to do all that stuff knowing that it's going to be on her mind when she gets to heaven and her husband's going to be there? Can she really believe in eternal life that she's going to be out here doing whatever? So you just think about it. What about the men? And they believe this, and they, and they believe they got eternal life, and they're going to live forever. Oh, glad the old hag's going down and get me a good woman, huh? Well, if that's what they believe, what are they going to tell that old hag when they get to heaven? Because she's not going to be an old hag in heaven. She's going to be the most beautiful thing he ever seen in his life. Yeah. In John chapter 20, verse 31, the Bible said that these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. John says to us the purpose of his writing in the gospel is stated as such, so that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that in believing you can have eternal life. You know, if we look at 1 John 5.13, these things have I written unto you, that you may know that you have eternal life. Yeah, you can know it today, right now. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ right now, you can know right now, this very moment, that you have eternal life, and you'll be going to heaven. What's your alternative? Your alternative is not believing and going to a devil's hell. In John 1, verse 1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. It tells us about the pre-existence of Christ. Then he says in chapter 4, verse 14, Whoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give you shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is what the Lord's giving us this morning. This water that's going to take us into eternity. And you can say this morning, because I'm 74 years or 75 years old and my wife is 74, well, I guess the reason you're so close to God is because you're up there preaching now and you're close to God right now, but you haven't always been. You're right, I haven't always been. There have been some times in my life I've been as far away from God as a man could get. But you know what? One day, I came face to face with an almighty God. And while he told me, he simply said, I love you. You think about that. How many people have told you today that they love you? When you come face to face with Almighty God, and He says, you know what? I died on the cross for you. I love you so much. I died on the cross for you. How are you going to turn your back on someone like that? 35 years ago, that's exactly what happened to me. 35 years ago, the Lord came to me you know, the water that I shall give him shall become a well of water springing up unto life eternal. 
John chapter 6, verse 51. Jesus is speaking again. He says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, and which I will give for the life of the world. And Jesus says, whoever eats his flesh and drinks his blood will have eternal life. In John 10, 27, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hands. The only way you can get away from God now is to walk away. I said, no man will take you out of here. They can t- you can walk out this church this morning, and they can entice you to do whatever. But if you're a child of God this morning, God's going to hang on to you. He's going to hang on to you, and he's not going to let go. And there's no man, no matter what they can say to you, is going to take you away from you. Only you yourself. You will have to say, I don't want no more part of you, Jesus. Let me alone, and let me do what I want to do. That's the only way you're going to get away from God. John 17, verse 3, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. You know, you can choose to do nothing, and let come what may be your course, 1 John chapter 5, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. And then in verse 21, he says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now we got this great idol that they're fixing... Oh, no, they're just worshiping this great idol right now. You can't even hardly get in and out of Walmart right now for their idols. They got Christmas trees for sale down there that's $150 and $200 and $300. They got people running around. We went to Walmart the other day for Marie to get some groceries, and I got run into three times by people pushing shopping carts. One woman liked to knock me clean across the aisle, come speeding down through there. Now I was standing watching her coming, and she ran right into me and knocked me two feet away. She was going so fast. I was standing up at the cash register. Another woman ran into it, wasn't it? Another time, I'm walking by, and somebody banged me in the room in. They're in such a hurry. They didn't, they're serving their idols. They don't know what they're doing. And if you don't think if you don't think Santa Claus is in the Bible, it's in the Bible. In Revelation chapter two, it talks about the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans? The Nicolaitans are people that believe in Nicholas, Saint Nicholas. Those are Nicolaitans. And according to the Word of God, in two places there, Jesus says he hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now Jesus hates these Nicolaitans. How is any of them people going to get to heaven? But yet they're out there pushing in carts and running over top of you. Don't get in their waist because they're trying to spend their money like this. You know, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That's the end of it. Keep away from idols. And that's what this stuff is. This is not about the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was never born in a... In, 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 in the December when there was snow on the ground. If he was, how could the shepherds be in the field tending their flocks? That's a lie. There was never no three wise men at the, at the place that he was born. If he was born in a manger, there was no wise men there because he was, a, he was a young child when the wise men came, almost two years old. So that's another lie. And Santa Claus wearing a red suit, that's another lie from the devil because Jesus Christ, when he ascended up into heaven, he has a vesture dipped in blood. That means it's, it's red. That's why his Santa Claus comes in a red suit, because he's trying to take Jesus' place. Keep yourself from idols. That's what he says. That's the only way you're going to make it to God, is keeping yourself pure. Keep away from these idols. God gives us all a sense of eternity. Eternal life is a gift of God through His Son, Jesus Christ. When we think about eternal life, we think about life after death. But there's more than that. 
for the believer, eternal life is right now. That means living for the Lord right now. Keeping away from idols is living for the Lord right now. You know, God is eternal. Eternal life is God living in you. You know, this is what we were made for. We were made to know God. What am I if I don't have eternal life then? I'm not made to know God because God is eternal. You think God wants to know me? How many friends do you have? Oh, I knew that person ten years ago, but I don't know him anymore. If God knows you now, he'll know you in eternity. He'll know you forever. What is the best thing in life? To know God. Eternal life means more than a mere future blessing for the believers to enjoy. Eternal life is not a peculiar feeling inside. If you're born again, eternal life is that quality of life that you now possess. You're not wrapped up in the world. You're not wrapped up with the world telling you what you should do and what you shouldn't do. You're listening to what God has to say. Keep yourselves away from idols. Eternal life is a gift from the Lord. And those who put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ for salvation is going to inherit eternal life. They're going to live it now, and they're going to live it after they pass. God is not like us. We have gifts. You know, when we're mad at the present, you know, we give a gift back. Oh, I'll pay you back. That's what people do. That's the gift that people give. I'll pay you back for the wrong you did to me. I'm going to do twice as wrong to you. Yeah, I, I forgive, but I don't forget. I, that's the kind of gifts that we give. But God gives us the gift of eternal life. Have you been doubting the, God ha- the love that God has for you? Well, God is not like us. He says that you have eternal life. If God says it, then it's true. You have it. You have it right now. If he says your sins are forgiven, then your sins are forgiven right now. You know, God says, I will not remember your sins. That's what he means. I won't remember your sins. God is love. That means it's unconditional. You say, well, I love so and so. But God loves you enough that he died on the cross for you. Who are you going to die for this morning? Or better yet, who are you going to hell for? Because if you're not on your way to heaven, you're on your way to hell. And so if you're on your way to hell, who are you going to hell for? Because you can have some idol? Because you can have this and you can have that? What's going to happen to this, that, and the other? In a few years, it's all going to get old and rusty. None of us have done anything to deserve God's grace. We can't do anything to maintain what God has given us. Because God said it was a free gift. A free gift. You know all I can say this morning, I've been up here for 53 minutes, 53 minutes telling you about eternal life. But I, during that 53 minutes, I've already had eternal life. I already know I'm going to live forever. You can destroy this body. Like Jesus said, in three days I'll rise again. <laughs> you can destroy this body, but within minutes, within seconds of you destroying this body, I'll be in heaven. You can't take away something God has given me. You didn't give it to me, then you can't take it away. Jesus gave it to me. And he says you're going to have it forever. You can have this eternal life if you don't have it right now. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, he says, and you will be saved. Without God's grace, we can do nothing. With God's grace, I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. On my own, I can't do anything. Is God reaching out this morning? God is reaching out. He's saying to you, I love you this morning. Do you love me back? He says, I love you, but do you love me back? Hmm? You think about that. We're going to have altar call now. If you want to come to the altar, I invite you to come up here and talk to the Lord. And say, Lord, you know what? I don't even have to tell you what, because you already know. i got to do something about my life. And what I need to do about it, I need to do now. You know, go to cross that railroad track to go somewhere today. You don't hear the train, the train runs over you. You don't have to be concerned. 
within a split second you'll be where you're going to be for eternity. Will it be heaven? Or will it be someplace else? Eternity's here and now. If it runs over me, oh well, I'm ready. I don't have to go kiss my wife bye. I'm ready to go. She'll be there with me. It won't be long. Charlie told me before he left, he says, you know what, when I get there, I'm going to be standing up there waiting on you. And I said, Charlie, how do you know you're going before me? Oh, I know. I said, how do you know? Because I know. And I'm going to be there waiting on you. That's what he told me. Yeah, I'm going to be waiting. Don't take too long. I said, well, I'll be here as long as the Lord wants me to be. Anyhow, I invite you all now to come to the altar. Thank you.